Now would you please turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to turn to chapter 18, which we read part of this, this evening earlier on. Matthew 18, and I'll read again just the first four verses. Matthew 18 and from verse 1 to verse 4. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now we find here an instance where the disciples, it has to be said, are not at their best. The other gospel accounts have a record of, of this where they are debating, arguing, quarrelling, inquiring as to who should be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. On one occasion, they wanted, or two of them particularly wanted, the, the seat of highest honour, to be next to Christ, to be in that exalted position of seating one at his right and one at his left hand. And here they are, no names particularly mentioned, but it seems that each of them is hoping, if not expecting, that they might receive some special favour. Perhaps there was envy among them. Remember how that it was Peter, James and John that were taken up into the Mount of Transfiguration? And maybe the other, the other nine were saying, well, why them? Why them all the time? They're the ones that get the particular honour and the particular favour. And perhaps there was a degree of envy between one and another. And then there's Peter, of course, the one who's always spoken to or speaking and perhaps they're thinking of him and saying to themselves, why them, why not, or why him rather, and why not me? And so they come to, this, to the Lord here in verse 1 and they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Secretly thinking to themselves, well perhaps he'll say that I am. We don't know, but perhaps that's what was in their minds. And in answer to this, the Lord calls a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There they are, wondering among themselves who will be greatest, and the Lord turns the whole thing around and says, Well, actually... Not so much a matter of being greatest, it's about humbling yourself because unless you do that, you won't even enter into the kingdom of heaven at all. And the whole thing then is, is turned typically by the Lord Jesus Christ into an occasion of teaching the most basic truth but the most important truth that anyone in all the world could ever hear or learn, to be humbled before Almighty God. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the Lord takes up a little child, and he must have been a pretty little child because according to Mark's account of this same um, incident, he took him up in his arms and that would indicate to me that the child must have been a pretty small one. And so you have this picture of these 12 grown men, whether they were standing in a circle we're not quite sure, but 12 grown men and a little child standing in the middle of them. Can you imagine the scene? Full grown men looking down at this little child, some of them had been fishermen of course, and. Uh, quite um, strong looking characters perhaps, them looking down at this little child and the child perhaps looking up at them, towering above, above him or her. But the, the, the picture that the Lord draws here of course is not some physical dif difference but, but the difference of character. Here are these men 
showing that they're self-centered and proud and ambitious with a burning curiosity about things. And on, this, on the other hand, there's this little child. We don't know if it was a boy or a girl. We don't know its name. We don't know who its parents were. We don't know what became of it later. But there are these 12 disciples and this little child. And who is it that we're to emulate? Who is it that is applauded, as it were, by the Saviour? These grown men, disciples that have been with the Lord for all these months or even years by now. No, it wasn't them. This little child. They were to learn from it. It's quite astonishing, isn't it? What an object lesson in, in teaching. To take something that is so opposite to what we grow up thinking ourselves or what we naturally are inclined to believe ourselves and with all our education and our sophistication and all our presumptions and all the rest of it and God says to us you know you've got it all wrong you got it all wrong look at a little child and you will learn more from a little child than you have done in the, all of your life because where you've got to where you stand tonight is that you're proud you're self-seeking you're presumptuous you want to be in the preeminent place but you will learn everything from this little child that's standing right next to you. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, there are, there's a number of different qualities or virtues that belong to little children. There are three of them that I want to bring out before you tonight. And, and th this is what we're to be converted to. This is how we're to be ourselves. The first virtue is surely this. Humble. Humble. You see that word there in verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as little, this little child. Well, children are, well, they're not perfect. Of course they're not. We're talking about an ideal child here. Just as when the Bible speaks about a father, he sp speaks about the, the ideal father very often. But, you know, children are very small, aren't they, compared to others? That's the first thing that you, that you notice. They're very small compared to others. And it's obvious. And it's obvious to a child. They know it. Adults are bigger. They know more. They have more. They can do more. And children are accepting of that. What can they do beside what the adult can do? And children know they need help. They need it and they welcome it when it's given unto them. This is the first and obvious thing. Adults are bigger and greater than children. And that's how we begin our lives, of course, as little children. We know that there are others in the world who are greater than us. They know more than we do. They can do more than we can. But how quickly, as we grow up through the years, we develop pride. Pride. It's an ugly thing when we have an overinflated view of ourselves. But not only that, it's a most self-destructive thing in our hearts and in our minds. We miss so very much if pride stops us from seeking the help that we need. And it's humility that we need. Humility, like a little child, realising that there are those around us who are greater, and more than that, realising that there is a God who is infinitely greater than we are. Humility. Do we need to be humbled? Do we need to be humbled? Do we need for God to humble us? If there's any sensibility within us, really, it wouldn't be hard to be humbled. Look around at the world today and you see people who are, well, this is a controversial statement perhaps. Maybe it would be better to say if you look through the pages of history, you will read about great men, great women. Great men and great women whose names are right across the history books. The things that they did, the kind of people that they were. Have you ever read biographies of some of these famous people and, and you read them and I don't know about yourself but certainly as far as I'm concerned I, I read some of the 
the, the lives of these people and I think to myself, well, I've done nothing. Nothing. No, I'm a pygmy compared to these giants who have come across the, the world and all that they've accomplished, the, the impact that they've had upon the world of their time. We only have to look at truly great men. But more than that, we only have to take a look at truly great spiritual people. Men of faith, men of prayer, men who lived such fruitful lives. Have you ever read Christian biographies? How that they were converted out of the world, how that they did such wonderful things in the name of God, the, the difference that they made, made to, to other people's lives. I was reading, or still in the process of reading, um, a, a, a book that uh, I discovered where we were on, on holiday and um, didn't finish reading it once so I bought it since I got back and I'm still reading the rest of it. It's, a, it's a, not a biography, but it's an account of some of the, the works of a man called John Ashworth. I don't know whether you've ever heard of him, but he was a businessman up in, up in the town of Rochdale in, in Lancashire. And he was converted quite wonderfully early in his life, and he was a quite successful, prosperous businessman, but, but he used his money and he used his life to do much good for many, many people. He opened up, or he built and opened up, what he called a chapel for the destitute. And he specifically went around the town and the whole area trying to encourage people who maybe he thought they wouldn't be quite so welcomed in ordinary churches, but he opened up this particular chapel and he went round and almost grabbed them by the scruff of the neck and said, now you come to hear a word that will be for your good. Come and hear the gospel. And this place was thronging with these people. And if you read the book, you'll, you'll read about the conversion of some of them. Wonderful things. Well, I read a book like that. This was the point of why I was mentioning it. And I think to myself, well, here was a man that was raised up from, by God. And look at what he did. And there are countless others. And if we look at such men and women and think of the kind of people that they were, it again, it makes us feel so very small as though we've hardly begun to live the Christian life or to do anything really worthwhile of a lasting kind. But if we really want to be humbled, we only have to take a look at Jesus Christ. Only look at him and we will feel and see our great smallness. What he is as God. The one who made the heavens and the earth. What he can do as God. We're told in the scripture that he's the one who sustains the whole universe. He keeps it as, he, as it is, as, he was, as it was first created there, in its existence even. Look at what he was as man. If ever a man did great things in the course of his life in this world, it was Jesus Christ. In three years, look at the lives that he touched. Look at the difference that he made to the community around Look at the impact that he made on the religious world of his time. But more than that, look at the impact that what his life and death has had upon thousands and thousands and thousands of people across the world and across the ages. And we look at him and we just feel as though we're little people. And there we are. We like to think of ourselves as so accomplished and so able and so deserving. When we look at him and look back at ourselves, what are we in comparison? And it's humbling. Have you ever stopped them to really, I mean honestly, to really consider and think about the Lord Jesus Christ? Who and what he is? Who are, who are we compared to him? The little child and the disciples? Great gulf of difference. They were proud. The child was humble. But if we look at Christ, the gulf is immediately much, much greater. And there's a lesson for us. We need to be, as a child, looking up at the greatness, the majesty, the purity, the holiness of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Do we think that we're loving people? Well, our love is nothing like the love of Christ. Coming into the world as he did to save people like we are proud people, 
stubborn people, rebellious people, but he came out of love to die for the very sins that we're guilty of. Well, there's one virtue of a little child. Another one is that a little child is dependent. Children are dependent upon adults, and they know it. They know it. They've got nothing of their own. They have to depend upon adults. Sometimes we tease our grandchildren. If we take them out somewhere, we have to say to them, well, where's your money then? How are we going to pay for this? Where's, where's your money? Get your purse out. Get your wallet out. And they look up at you as though you've said the most ridiculous thing in all the world because they haven't got anything. And they know it. And they're relying upon us to pay for them. They know that's where they can turn. That's, we're the ones that they can rely upon. They've got nothing of their own. They're completely and utterly dependent for provisions, for protection, for comforts, for all things. The child is dependent and he knows it. And we are all dependent on Almighty God. We all are. We're sitting here tonight and we've got our health. Why do we think that we've got that? We're sitting here tonight and we're able to, to breathe air. Where did that come from? We're here tonight, we've had a good meal or more today through the, the hours of the day. Where did that come from? We say, well, it's because I worked for it and then I cooked it. But really, where did the strength come from? Where did the enabling come from? Where did the provisions ultimately come from? It's all from the Lord, and we're completely and utterly dependent upon that. Whether it's something we realise or not, or whether it's something that we admit to or not, that's the fact of the matter. The Lord has made the world to be inter or intradependent. The one part of the world is dependent on the other, the whole way that nature works it's, it's dependent upon the various aspects and compartments of the natural world. That's the way that the Lord has made things. Nations, in, in a sense, are dependent upon other nations. People are dependent upon other people. But all creatures, the whole creation, is dependent entirely upon the Lord. For life itself, its preservation, our lives hang upon a thread and that thread is held by, held by God. We're dependent upon the Lord for our provisions. As I say, all things come ultimately from him. It's his decree that brings seed time and harvest round year by year by year by year and provides for our needs. And most certainly, we are dependent completely and utterly upon him for salvation. We cannot make it alone. Proud people think that they can. Proud people think that they have a part to pray. Proud people think that they have a contribution to bring. Some people are so proud that they don't think they need a saviour at all. That they're not dependent upon another. But we all are. We're completely and utterly dependent. If it wasn't for the fact that God had given us his word, we would never know the truth. We're dependent upon the Bible for the truth of things. We wouldn't know what God is like. We wouldn't know what we are really like were it not for the word of God. We're dependent upon the Lord to find a way to God. An atonement that actually atones. Not some fake facade of a work that we might grasp at and think, well, perhaps this will do it. Perhaps that will do it. Perhaps things won't be so bad after all. Perhaps the Lord will turn a blind eye to the wrong things that have been part of my life for so very long. That's all clutching at straws. It's hopeless. We're completely dependent upon Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us an atoning sacrifice that does actually do the job of atonement and opens up a way to heaven that really and honestly takes us there. That's the gospel message. And we're dependent upon the Lord for that. And we need to realise it. As I say, children know who they can depend on. They know where they can go. And when they're in trouble, they soon go there. Don't they? I suspect all of us have got, maybe if not our own children, then we've, we've come across little children, perhaps others, in the family of, for in, in some way or another. And we've been, we've been there at a time when they've, they've fallen, they've stumbled, they've hurt their knee, they, 
They cry because they're hurt. They look around for somewhere to comfort and there's mum or there's dad. And what do they do? They run, don't they? They know where to go. And why do they run to their parents? Well, because they know that that's the place where they will find the help that they need at that particular time. So we need, like children, to realise our dependence upon the Lord. To look at the real state of things, to realise and face up to the fact that all we need only comes from Him. Have we never ever really honestly seen our personal helplessness in the matter of salvation? The Holy God and a lost sinner. How could we possibly think that we can make things right ourselves? It's utterly out of the question and we are completely dependent upon the Lord for that. A third quality is this, that a child is trusting. A child trusts his parent. The parent is greater, the parent is the one upon whom he depends and the child trusts that parent because he has come to know that that parent obviously loves him. It's obvious. He doesn't need to have it explained. He doesn't need to be persuaded of it. It's obvious that the parent loves him. He has never failed him, never turned him away. And why in all the world would that child not trust that parent? Well, if that's true in human terms, how much more true is it in terms of God? Because without question, God is worthy to be trusted. Once we are humble, once we realise our dependence upon the Lord, and once we come to God for the matter of our salvation, we will find that he is worthy to be trusted indeed. He never, ever failed anyone who turned to him. You can read through the gospel accounts of all these people who were lame or blind or deaf or dumb or possessed by a devil and they came or they were brought to the Lord Jesus Christ not once, not once did he fail them. And you can read the biographies of Christian people over the centuries and not once did he fail that repentant sinner. And there are many of us here tonight who can vouch for the same fact that he has not failed us once. Have we been filled with sins? He's forgiven us. Have we been lost and fearful? He's come to us. Have we come to him trusting in his words of promise? Those words have been fulfilled because every word is true. Every promise is sincere. Every promise is perfectly fulfilled for those who will trust him. What a very heinous sin not to trust the Lord, not to place ourselves in his gracious and saving hands. How can we question his integrity? How can we doubt his power or his goodness? How can we possibly trust ourselves rather than trust him? What a height of folly that really is. So we need to be childlike in this respect, to learn to trust him without doubts and without questions for salvation. That is the main, the greatest thing that touches our hearts and lives. Nothing whatsoever is as important as that. And we won't have it if we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn to trust him for salvation. Learn to trust him then after that for all things, of course, in all the circumstances of life and at all times. So Jesus says in verse 3 here, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know what this word converted means. It's a very simple word. It's often used in Christian jargon. But it simply means to be turned from one thing into another. To be changed from one person 
into another. And that's what the Lord Jesus is calling for, for these disciples that were proud and self-seeking that day. Except he be converted, you need to be changed. Your whole persons need to be altered and, and turned from one thing into another. You need to be turned from these proud, self-centred men that you're showing yourselves to be into people who are just like this little child standing in the middle of you all. Humble, dependent, trusting. This would have been a great change for them as it will be a great change for us because we're naturally just like they are or were. It's a great change, a colossal change, a great challenge for us to think that, that uh, advanced, sophisticated people in the world, we say to ourselves, we, we've been around a bit, we've seen one, a, a thing or two in the course of our lives, we've learned how to handle ourselves and to face up to our troubles, we, we, we can manage, we can cope, we always have done, we always will. That's, that's our natural reaction to things. No, says the Lord. Oh no, that's not the way to be. It needs to be a great change. You need to be like this little child. But you notice as well, it's a necessary change. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless we become like those children who are humble and dependent and trusting in the Lord, will not even enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I ask you, have you been converted? Have you been changed? Has God come to you and changed you from the person that you've always been into a person that is like this little child? We need to be like that. It's a very solemn thing, isn't it? Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But of course, you can turn the whole sense of that around and you can say that if you are converted, if you do become like the little child, humble and dependent and trusting in the Lord, then you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's the positive side of it. And that's the side that needs to be impressed upon us. So we need to be humble, to face up to our sin. It is there. We can't deny it. We are helpless. We can't deny that either. We are to be humble before God. He is right. We've been wrong all these years. And we are dependent upon the Lord. Admit it. Face up to it. Realise that we are completely reliant upon him and his mercy and in his grace. And then turn to Christ and trust him. Trust him for his salvation. Trust him for all his promises. Trust him that our lives will thankfully never be the same again. They will be raised up and changed. We have God as our saviour, God as our guide, God as our provider, God as the one who will at the end welcome in, into, into heaven. We are changed, our lives are changed, our whole future is changed, everything is different. Our relationship with God is altogether new. And this is what the, the word of God is all about, this is what the saviour is alluding to here really. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Be converted. Be converted. Humble yourself before God. Admit that he is what he is, he's who he is, he's what he is like. And admit that you are what you are. And admit that what you need is his salvation. And trust him for it. And he'll give it to you. And my friends, you'll never, ever be the same again converted, saved, and bound for heaven. The message that comes from our Saviour. Let's pray together. Lord, make us humble, we pray. Take away the pride of our hearts. We know how stubborn we can be. We know how foolish we can be. We know how Hard it seems at times to admit that God is right 
and that we are wrong, that we're not the clever, self-sufficient people that we've always claimed to be. We live in a world of uncertainty and we're living in that world of uncertainty without God. And at the end of our days, what shall befall us? But that awful eternity that is hell that shall be the lot of all those who die in their sins. Lord, help us not to be proud. Help us not to be foolish. Help us not to be self-dependent. Help us not to be mistrustful of thy word. Oh, change us, Lord. Help us that we may be humble before thy mighty presence. Help us that we may depend upon thee for all things, especially the matter of our salvation. And help us to trust that Jesus Christ truly and actually is the one who will save us, all by his grace, all through his mighty love. Lord, we pray that thou wilt deal with us all and bring us into thy kingdom even this very night. And we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen.